Thank you. Look, it really gives me pleasure to um, introduce Professor Stephen Lamb. Many of you will have seen Stephen before or heard of Stephen. He's had uh, a lot to do with education over the last, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure how many years now, Stephen, um, and has worked with VAS, but certainly worked with the department and departments around Australia as well in terms of um, funding and, and the like and equity. And a couple of years ago, he gave a fairly provocative um, expose here on funding and equity in state education, and um, we've asked him to come back to give us a bit of an idea of what are some of the trends and what's happening currently. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks very much, Frank. It's uh, great uh, to be able to get the opportunity to come back and talk to you. Uh, particularly, uh, I see it as a privilege to be able to come back and talk about the work I do and uh, some of the things I've been doing over the last period of time as they relate to sort of funding and equity. Um, and so, in the last two or a couple of years, since the Gonski uh, review, basically, my systems are moving towards implementing some sort of model that's rather similar to Victoria's in one form or another. Uh, there are different stages of that, but that's largely... Um, I look at the uh, various reviews that I've <coughs> currently got underway or that I've been involved in over the last 12 months. Uh, South Australia has just started their review of school funding, which I'm, I've... Uh, got only a few weeks left in the school term to be able to get a lot of information I need from schools in <coughs> South Australia. But this year we've undertaken reviews in Northern Territory and the ACT, and both of those jurisdictions uh, are going to try to implement um, a sort of an SRP type model. West Australia, I did the work a few years ago, and they've been in the process of implementation, and that's hit a critical point this year, as well as Tasmania. But there's also <coughs> currently work involving funding that I've been involved in in Victoria. There is a, a funding reform unit in the department that was set up some time ago, headed by Andrew Nate. Uh, there's a set of work that's coming out there. It's mainly focused in um, on equity funding, both within schools and the vet sector. There are two pieces of work in that that I've been sort of more involved in, in an advisory role, but they're interesting pieces of work. Uh, because they will see, and the reform idea here is to expand and to better target equity funding for Victoria. So a piece there which is about the eff effective investment to improve educational outcomes, the question being asked there, because any um, application or any proposal that goes into DTF for extra funding has got to have background support. So that piece of work is looking at what evidence do we have about equity funding having any impact across jurisdictions around the world. So that's been an interesting piece because we've been looking at how other countries set up their equity funding for schooling and any evidence they have on impact. And overall, there is evidence of impact. So where systems, particularly we can look at a high-performing systems, put in quite a bit in this in various forms. But you could also look at it programmatically and so sort of look at the different programs that schools uh, implement using their equity funding and some of those have impact, and it's important that we, we've got that documented. The other piece is then to look at, well, how much? And that's what we're doing by looking at other systems around the world, in how, they've, uh, how much they're putting in, and in what way, as a guide. And that's to support applications to Treasury and Finance for further funding. I'm also involved at the present moment in the school reform evaluation. This is a three or four year project, trying to look at the reform initiatives that the, the current government's been involved in. I won't express any view on what those reforms look like or anything like that, but uh, there's potential within that work over the next three to four years to actually capture good practice that's going on in Victoria schools and what impact it's having. Also, we've got underway at the present moment the MIPS review, which has started about two or three weeks ago, and I appeal to you because we're going to have... Uh, um, a couple of questionnaires online, one for the MIPS coordinators in your schools and one for yourselves as principals. Uh, we're interested, and they're wanting to look at the, uh, uh, at the way MIPS operates, what sort of impact it's having, how it can be improved, and included in that is the initial funding of is it right, uh, or how, how better could it be targeted. So that's coming your way shortly, probably within the next week or two.
There's also another piece of work around issues for region, rural and regional schools. This is an ongoing issue in Victoria and in other jurisdictions, just about um, how we can ensure that we target funding appropriately for rural and regional schools, and there's sets of issues involved in that. So in terms of those other reviews that I've been involved in in other jurisdictions, it all comes back and it's been initiated by the Gonski Review, basically. Now, there's a lot of discussion around Australia about Gonski, mainly in terms of the funding levels, the amount of additional funding, the extra $5 billion. But actually, putting the funding aside, more fundamental is the reform impact that the model has in terms of the way schools are allocated funds. Because at the base of it is a per capita SRS, a, a, a resource standard, with adjustments for equity. It's very similar to what SRP does. And it's, it's um, you know, no mistake that, in fact, the, the, the design of uh, Gonski's work is based on what occurred here in Victoria because Victorians were heavily involved in the, in the design of the Gonski work. I actually met Gonski for about an hour, David Gonski, for about an hour in Sydney as part of uh, an ACT delegation. And he's, I, I must admit, rather pessimistic, given the fact that all the states have back-ended back their funding of about 80% which they'll never see because of the current government. So it is a real question about how much additional funding will come by virtue of this, particularly given that National Partnerships funding is removed at the same time. So particularly for low SES schools, it is a big issue. Uh, the other thing, element that he was, um, he did say to me that he, um, in, in looking at, he was hamstrung by the ori original directive from the Commonwealth Government, which was no school could lose. Because he said he wouldn't have sought the additional levels of funds necessarily, he would have thought for a redistribution of funds, and particularly from the private schools, which was an interesting observation. But um, the principles of the needs-based funding, which all the other jurisdictions are currently looking at, New South Wales has implemented its own model, Queensland's in the path at the present moment doing the same thing as well as the others, is like here, we have a per capita standard resource base, like our core SRP fund level. And that has to be adjusted for different categories of equity by social status, disabilities, ATSI status, English language proficiency and remoteness. They're the key ingredients. Interestingly, in Gonska, he talks about a further adjustment to be made based on parents' anticipated capacity to contribute locally raised funds. Now, I took this as meaning, well, private schools. Private school fees have to be taken into account, but the other jurisdictions haven't necessarily interpreted it that way. So as part of the work I've been doing, they've all asked, can I look at how much money is um, collected at a local level across schools within the government sectors? Um, but I have left it alone at the end in, in all of the work I've done. And of course, like the SRP, it's supposed to be reviewed every four years because once you set out a, a per capita amount, you've got your equity loadings, things change over time, systems have different directions. Um, the equity categories, the composition of populations can change. So it needs to be recalibrated. So we need to review it every, every so often. Now there, I've just set out some principles of fair student funding, um, which are important and have driven all of the reviews that have gone on. So, and, and they're basically the school budgeting should, you know, fund students fairly and adequately, but prevers, preserving stability for, for all schools. And that particularly means for small schools, because on a per capita basis, they just don't get enough. So we need to ensure that they have a minimum amount of money to be able to operate with, to be able to provide their service. Different students have different needs, and we need to be able to adjust for those and provide the adequate amounts of money to be able to target the need. Um, it's still an issue for me about what size that is, and I'll come back to that issue later on. The, the, the Gonski approach is also based on the sense that you're in the best position to decide how to use your money. You're best to know what your students need, what your teachers need, and what's going to work in, in your community. So it's you rather than the central officers that are best positioned to decide how to improve achievement. So really the process here should be to try and empower you through funding to be able to do what you need to do. And school budgets need to be as transparent as possible, which, having looked at these other jurisdictions, it's like Victoria of 20 or 30 years ago, it's very difficult to see any transparency uh, because of deals that have been done over time and 
why the funding operates. And these are the sorts of kit arrangements that have existed in all of them, the ACT, the Northern Territory, WA, Tasmania, the lot. And it's very much like here of, of some decades ago, which is, you know, there's a school staffing allocation. There's no account taken for how much those staff cost. As long as the school gets a, a teacher, it doesn't matter how costly or experienced that teacher is, that's the allocation. So that still operates in all the other jurisdictions. Um, and there's about a 70% of the, of the resources that is allocated through a staffing mechanism and formula. And there's a base and equity recurrent operational funding allocation because there's also a cash component. So there's a staffing component, a cash component. And a cash component is generally delivered on the basis of enrolments with some adjustments, adjustments for equity and a few other things. And there's special purpose payments. Now that model may seem familiar for those who have been around here for a long time, to how we used to operate. Now in the reviews, this is what the system's asking you to look at. And it's the same way you take a review for Victoria. You know, what are the drivers of student performance? So what do we need to target to get ensure our funding is, is being directed in the best possible way to deliver the best outcomes? So, and then how can we best target it? Okay, we, um, we understand what are the drivers of performance, how can we better target what we've got to address that need? And look at the relationships between that and funding, and, um, and then also uh, and then develop a needs-based model. So I first want to start here by just looking at the equity challenges that government secondary schools are facing across those jurisdictions, including some information on Victoria. Now, this is a, a, a information, this is the Year 9 Reading Achievement by Ixia. I have, it's very interesting, um, Ixia is problematic scale for Victoria because uh, of the elements that are in it. But it's still the only measure I can use nationally, so I've, I've used it here. And this is looking at Year 9 Reading Achievement by Ixia, which is across the bottom. Uh, let's see, across the bottom of the scale. And this is the reading score, the main reading score. Now the red line here is the national average for students in government schools only. The black line is the Ixia average across Australia for government schools. And these four jurisdictions are markedly different. If we look at the Northern Territory, and the Northern Territory is basically two systems. It's, there's a white and a black system in the Northern Territory. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's still very divided. And the, it's the way that the funding operates, uh, and it's, it's certainly, when you look at it in performance terms, there are two populations. If we look at here, this group of schools here, they're all in remote and very remote communities, and they're all mainly all indigenous. 46% of students in government schools in the Northern Territory are Indigenous. So there's a group of schools here, mainly in Darwin, and they're the only ones that approximate and get close to the national average. And you can see in terms of Ixia, they're all from Lois. There's massive challenges. In terms of looking at Northern Territory, I've never seen, I don't think there is any other system like it in an OECD country. The challenges that that faces and it comes through in their performance. Now the ACT on the other hand, and we know a lot about this, a very homogeneous, middle class, and yet it too has some real challenges. It's interesting. Here, there's their schools, and you can see the Ixia line there, meaning virtually all the schools are middle class, they're above the Ixia average. Their performance is similar to that, but it is still heavily influenced by SES, the SES intake of the schools. In fact, that R2 there, that the R squared, 0.82 is the largest of any of the jurisdictions in Australia. So despite it being middle class, despite it having, there's no school in the ACT that would get SFO funding. But um, SES has a bigger impact in the ACT than it does elsewhere, which is a very interesting aspect when we look at performance. Here's Victoria. Now these schools here are all performing with averages in year nine reading well above the national average. There's still a very strong impact of SES, which down that through that line, and a, you know, a 0.68. That our, our squared value of 0.82 means that we don't really need the NAPLAN score. We could predict what that score would be just by knowing the ICSIA intake of the score, the ICSIA score. 
And the same here with WA, it's a very interesting. These are more indigenous schools in outer communities, but and there are some schools here, similar to Victoria, that are above the average. But it doesn't matter which of these jurisdictions. SES, social intake into these schools, it has its marked impact in every jurisdiction. And this is just to look at attendance rates by Exia, just for the Northern Territory and WA. There's something very frightening about the Northern Territory, which is they now fund on the basis of what they call an effective enrolment. So you might have 100 students, but it's weighted by your attendance rates. So these schools down here, which have a 50% attendance rate, they're only getting funded for half their students. But even the schools here, which are at the top end of the scale, they're adjusted down too. So they get about a 90% average attendance rate and their effective en enrolment is 90% of what they would get out of a full funding uh, model. But we can see here, that's the national average. There's virtually no school, there's only a couple of schools in the NT that get close to it. All the rest are well below and those figures are, are startling. With WA, it, the same issue. These are indigenous schools. Uh, there are a lot of schools here that are above that national average. They don't have an effective enrolment adjustment. Now this is something, I won't spend much time on it because I haven't got a lot of time here, but this is something I've been looking at with NAPLAN and trying to look at it across the, the states. As you know, here's the Year 7 NAPLAN scores. It's just the way NAPLAN is. It doesn't work properly. It's got ceiling effects. So the lower you start, the greater the gain you make. And it gets down to a point, this is year seven, students who started at that point actually lose. They go backwards. And then we have some schools on average here in Victoria that do that by virtue of the way the scale works. I've corrected that, um, I've corrected that by taking each starting point and looking at the average gain and looking at that for every student and therefore for every school. Because if you were to apply this, then schools on average which have kids who start well behind make this huge gain and they appear to be bridging gaps. But it's not true. So we've cr I've created a way of adjusting for this effect here. Now here at the top is what is year seven reading score and the reading gain. And this suggests that, uh, again, if this is in raw terms, the, the higher you start here in uh, um, the lower you start here, the greater the amount of gain. And that line down there. With the adjustments that I've made by taking every one of these as a starting point and looking at the average for every child at that point, that's actually the pattern. So we've got, and this is a slightly troubling thing because with the year seven reading scores here, because schools that actually start a little bit higher up are actually adding a lot as well. Now that's important for many schools to understand when they're looking at NAPLAN. Uh, and particularly our middle class schools that often feel that they're not, according to this scale, making much gain, but they are. And this tends to take it. So just trying to look at how and, and applying that scale and looking at the amount of gain. I have here looked at um, the adjusted reading gain from year seven to nine by the variation in gain scores. And what that means is that here we've got schools that are making lots of gain and there's a small amount of variation which just means that they're doing it for all their students. So all their students in their schools are benefiting <coughs> and gaining a lot. It's not this corner which is the opposite of that but actually this one. Because these schools here are not making good gain, they're going, the gain is very uh, much less, but it's affecting all their students. In these two quadrants, we've got this, they're making good gains, but there's a lot of spread within their school. So some schools are doing, some students are doing exceptionally well and others not. Now this is actually Victorian data, but I've looked at other cities as well. In terms of SFO, this is what the impact is. Here's the year seven reading by SFO, which is the raw scores. And when it's adjustment, we see a lot of spread. That's a high SFO school in Victoria, and it's making exceptionally good gain for its students. And here's the opposite, a high SFO school that's not. So there's a lot of spread here. 
the overall trend of this is a little bit troubling, which is that basically it means that gaps tend to be growing. These schools up here are bridging the gaps, the social gaps in performance, because they're making lots of gain and they're doing exceptionally well. And they are high SFO. The schools at the other end, which are mainly middle class schools, down the lowest years, they tend to be making strong gains for their students on average. And it's interesting here looking at the spread because this reflects the impact of inequality we've got in our system and the difficulty some of these schools have in trying to uh, work with the, the factors they're going to work with. So what's driving some of these challenges? Here I've just got the, the key sort of drivers of performance are those things and they're about school intake, who you have to deal with as a community as a school. But the big thing here for me is this thing called segregation and residualisation. Because in my view, Australia has one of the most segregated systems in the world, certainly across OECD nations. And what do I mean by segregation here? Private schools cream from the top. They take our most socially advantaged kids and they also take our highest performance. And that makes it so much more difficult for, for, uh, for, for government schools. Just to show you what that means, this is secondary schools. These, and, and I've broken all the, all the secondary school students in the state across the SES deciles here, 10 different groups of equal groups. Government schools here deal with everybody. There's, there's, virtually, there's no independent schools in here, or there's one, I think, that's got the sum, but very few. So 95% or more of the students that we deal with, it's government schools that are dealing with the, uh, the most disadvantaged uh, and the poorest in the state. At the other end, from here right the way across, we're down to about, as it say, 37% there and 40% here. And it's this growth in the independent schools, they take from the top. And this divides our communities. Just to give you a, sec a, a sense of what this means in terms of NAPLAN intake, here's uh, Year 7 Reading Achievers. This is in a provincial city of Victoria, and there's, uh, there's private schools there. And this is, this, this is the uh, distribution of NAPLAN reading achievement in 10 groups. So again, government schools in that city are only getting 30% of the highest achievers in terms of NAPLAN in year seven. So the intake at that point, you've lost 70% of the highest achievers already. Again, we deal, we take disproportionately from the other end. This just increases the challenges that we face because we've got um, an increase in the, the high proportion of low SES and disadvantage. We deal only with the disadvantage. Now, the disadvantage within the community, that bottom 20%, they're only in government schools. And it comes out here when we start to look at the NAPLAN profile. There's a guy in New Zealand, uh, Martin Thrupp, I think his name is, who's done work on looking at the social composition and the compositions of schools and its impact on performance. It's consistent with US research, shows it's huge. So who you get makes a big impact on how well you can perform, both as schools and students. And the French describe that in a way as pilots. You can't take pilots out of classrooms and push them off somewhere else and expect the school and the classroom to function in the same way. But that's what's happening. So we have to face this. We're caught up in a system of segregation and residualization. This is Canberra. And it's just to say, um, because compounding the private school effect, then we've got aspirational parents who bypass their local schools in favour of other schools. This pattern is in virtually every city and town in Australia that I've looked at. It's, um, and, and a lot of principals around in all the jurisdictions I've been talking to identify this pattern and uh, it has marked effects. So the question here for me was, well, our, our enrolments, are not linked to the size of the school age population. Here's Canberra, and look at each of these is a school and in its community, and this is the proportion of school aged children. And we don't see much of a pattern here. But we do when it comes to the school size, it's linked to SES. And that's because, again, parents on top of private schools are drawing kids away from certain schools and communities. And it creates this uneven division of labour. This is a town in um, an, another jurisdiction. It's actually, no, sorry, it's actually in Victoria. It's a town of 10,000. In 1999, 
there were four primary schools, and each of them had about 200 and, between 200 and 220 students. From 1999 to 2013, that's their experience. These are mid-SFO schools, these are high-SFO schools. That green school there has gone from about 210 down to about just on 100 students. And that purple school there has done the same. So now, we've, there's a residualisation process going on here as parents move their kids around and select schools. And it makes it much more difficult for these schools, smaller students, smaller budgets, uh, dealing with layers of disadvantage, because these, the students, when you look at them, will be of a particular sort. It just makes the, 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 um, the job of, of the schools much harder. And just to show what that looks like right across Australia, this is New South Wales, Northern Territory, Queensland, and WA. I've got here school sizes. These are secondary schools only, less than 300, 300 to 500, 508. And that's the average year. So right across Australia, we have this same pattern. The low SES schools have become smaller over time, and they are now smaller. And that has a, a, quite a large impact. Um, small achievement is lower, retention is lower, uh, reduces budgets, and concentrates layers of disadvantage in certain schools. So there's a division of labour. So how do we go about addressing this? In each of the other jurisdictions, these are the measures of SES that have been used up to this point. In the Northern Territory, they use uh, parental education occupation as provided to them by ACARA. In the ACT, they use ICSIA for identifying equity and allocating any funds. In WA, they have an area-based measure that they use, SEI. Um, and in New South Wales, a parental education occupation measure. Uh, and South Australia has a combined set of these measures. Now, in my view, SFO needs to be improved with the addition of education here in Victoria, parental education. And each of the jurisdictions have questions about how should we target our, our, our need. Should we use a student premium or a school loading? What do I mean by that? Well, a student premium would identify characteristics of a student, such as from a, a child who um, has English language issues, and target a, a funding for those, irrespective of where they are. A school threshold would say, no, we only deal with that when there's concentrations of it within certain schools, as happens with SFO. Now here's some resource allocations across stages in the other systems. This is just looking overseas and just to show what I mean with it. Victoria, there's our loading for prep coming down 3.4 and we come up here at one point, just a bit over 1.3 for all our, our year levels. This is London, which is quite, as you can see here, because of its very older style senior years, where it's because of the O and A levels it used to have. Alberta's interesting because it does the opposite. It funds early and then leaves that like that. Now, Here's what it is in the Northern Territory. <coughs> so they've got the first part, the entry point, slightly higher funds, comes down for the ladder. The first three years here, because they tend to have in the Northern Territory, they tend to have middle schools and then senior schools, and 1.22. If I look, and, and this is looking at the resource use and how schools are actually using their resources in the Northern Territory, there's quite a substantial gap here. And interestingly, this gap here between the blue and the red is it, it, it means that the most expensive and experienced teachers are being used in these year levels. This is the ACT. And the ACT is an interesting model because it has senior colleges. And actually, the resources currently in those senior colleges, because they concentrate, the uh, resource use is slightly lower than the other set, the high school years. That's looking at classroom teachers. If we add everything in, it's, that's what it is. It, it's at about that level relative to what we to, to this for primary schools. This is what it's been in the w, in WA. And it's those two there um, uh, reflect the history of, of WA. Now, they are uh, moving to change that and to even this out at this point. But that this, the rest of it is very similar to what we've got. Interestingly, they have Year 7 here, and it's in primary schools. 
that next year is being shifted into year eights, and they will be at that level. So these are the previous funding. The needs-based funding model, that's what it's supposed to deliver. Corporate funding on a per capita price, price adjusted for stage of schooling, base allocation versus smaller schools, core price for equity. So when it comes to the equity loadings, what are the other systems doing? This is WA's funding model, the one that they are adopting. Um, it's not necessarily the one I recommended, but it is the one they're adopting. Um, the stage weights, there they are, 1.2 up from prep through to year three, at one for four to six, 1.3 from seven to 10, and 1.4 for 11 and 12. They have a per capita price of 6,600, meaning about 2.1 billion is going into four. They have a base price for primary, which tapers, and for secondary of 400 and 750,000. And here's the equity loadings. For every ATC <coughs> student, they provide a per capita <coughs> grant of $1,556, meaning 34.4. And they increase that depending upon the concentration within the school. For SES, they have gone a pupil premium type of approach. They have $450 per student allocated on the basis of a, a um, students from particular backgrounds, and it gets weighted depending on the percentage of students in the bottom three deciles of SES. And at 78 million, it's about what goes in currently here in Victoria and SFO. Uh, but WA is a smaller state. The location, the EAL there, and the interesting one is disabilities. They have seven categories. The bottom category gets 9,000, the top gets 69,000 per student. And it jumps from nine to 23 in the second category. Now this is an, this is a, an overthrow of, of history because they've operated very, very small special schools at a very high price. And they um, adjusted the mainstream price based on that. This is what's happening in the Northern Territory. About 67% goes into base or core funding. The rest of it goes into equity, about 33%. And that goes into SES funding, 8% for Indigenous and so on here for remoteness, year level and uh, ESL or EALD funding and special ed. The striking thing for me here is um, that, you know, you could be, in other parts of the universe you know that the Northern Territory is 46% of kids in from Indigenous backgrounds and that all their performance is driven by it. And that's all, it, that's what it gets. So, the question for me, is that adequate? And particularly when they're using effective enrolment to actually target and fund schools. And that's just an example of how that plays out by looking at what the per capita amounts are, depending on those different elements. So, and this is the effective enrolment thing I was mentioning, because they adjust it based on um, your attendance patterns. Now there's two final points because, um, you know, David Gonski, when I met him in Sydney, was extremely pessimistic. He thought that all that was potentially in the potential to happen is now not going to happen by virtue of the fact that uh, a lot of funding is not going to end up with us. And he felt it was needed. And he, he felt it was needed not only in terms of addressing equity issues, but he felt also for stopping enrolment drift. And he made a point to the ACT authority and people that were there that you know, if the enrolment drift continues, and particularly in primary schooling in the ACT, it's your major function. One of your major functions is looking after schools. You as an authority will not have a function if this continues. So it remains as a, a, a critical issue. So, and I completely agree, we need more funding. There is a reform that's, uh, um, work that's going on at the present moment to look at additional funding for, for Victorian schools to deal with equity issues uh, and all those issues are still there currently. Premium, student premium or not, uh, school threshold, etc, etc. But I do have this question that I want to left, uh, leave with you which comes from one of the schools in WA that I've looked at. I didn't look at it this way necessarily at the beginning, I thought it was extremely disadvantaged. It has 342 students and I'm asking the question, in terms of equity funding, how much is enough? Because I had a journalist from the Australian Ring up and asked me about, can you give me an example of a disadvantaged school 
and the impact of funding. And I suggested they go to that school, which is in WA. The journalist rang back the next day and she said, sorry, but um, it's, you know, it's better funded than most private schools. Because in that particular school, given the way the loading's operated, and I, wasn't a, I didn't think through this enough when I gave her the example, because they multiplied all these weights together. The school had 340 students and was being funded as if it had 1,100. So there was about a teacher for every five students. And the problem for the school is it's at the bottom of the performance indicators on virtually everything. And it's had this money in play for some time. And so the question has to be asked, how much is enough? Because it was $28,000 a student. And you'd have to ask, if we can't get traction with that sort of level of funding, it's a big issue. And that leads me to the final thing here, which is linked to it. Ultimately, the funding is one thing, but it's what schools do with the money that matters. And for me, that school is actually doing a disservice to other schools that are in struggling circumstances. Because across Australia, we have a number of schools that don't get enough resources to deal with the need that they've got. And a school like that um, is, and sort of takes up the line that basically, you know, with that level of funding, they should be able to do something that they're not. So the, the funding doesn't seem to have impact. And that gets back then to, to asking the question, what are you actually doing with the money? So it's a very, I think, so I'm wanting to leave with that because I'm very much, uh, as you know, uh, in favour and pushing for further funding for equity. But it requires other parts of the, of, um, the equation to be met, which are when we get the funding, we need to do very good things with it. And we need to therefore look at what has impact and attempt to apply stuff that does. So I'm happy to take any questions. There's so much packed into that um, 40 minutes or so that um, Stephen had in terms of the challenges that we're facing right across Australia, but particularly the challenges we've been talking about for uh, the last decade or more here in Victoria. But the work Stephen's been involved in in Victoria and beyond, obviously, is having um, impacts on the way that governments are looking at funding education. So I think it's important for us to be engaged in these conversations um, and to get a, a feel for the reality of what that funding is being used for, what the stages are, and the implication or the, the uses of that money in, in different schools. And I think um, Stephen's final questions around, you know, how much is enough? And what are we actually doing with um, the money to make a difference in our schools, to be working with our staffs and communities and our kids to make a difference is really what our game is all about. Um, and we'll be much, very much involved in that as individual schools, as staffs and as VASP over the coming year and years. So anyway, could you please join me in thanking Stephen.